I love fish. I really love sashimi. It's so fresh, delicious, tastes like the ocean. I want to share some ideas about how we can keep the magnificent big fish of our oceans around for our grandchildren to enjoy in 20, 40, 60 years' time. As I grew up, my father was a really keen spear fisherman. He had a real love and appreciation for the oceans. And he passed that down to the next generation. My brothers and sisters and I, we're all ocean fanatics. We can't get enough of it. We're fishing or spear fishing or surfing or kayaking. So that's probably why, as a young kid, I was already chasing pelagic fish before I even knew what they were. I wasn't getting sashimi grade ones yet at that stage, but I was a good shot. My dad, he got slightly bigger fish <laughs> that were sashimi grade. I think the thing he really appreciated the most about the ocean was its ability to provide healthy, nutritious food. And for him, most importantly, it was free food. Because when you have 10 kids and you have to feed them in Australia, it's not cheap. When we were growing up, we didn't have designer clothes. We couldn't afford to take the whole family on overseas holidays. We didn't get the latest video game consoles. But we did eat well. We grew up on a diet of lobster and abalone and fresh fish. And this is an important point. The ocean doesn't just help feed my family. It helps to feed the world. And in some poor countries, subsistence fishing is the absolute livelihood of small artisanal fishermen. They're very survival in many cases. We love to eat the big pelagic fish of the ocean. Pelagic means free swimming, fish that lives its life in the water column, not down on the bottom associated with rocky habitat or sandy flats. The large pelagic oat fish roam the ocean. Their habitat's defined by water masses, ocean currents, and temperatures. But we love to eat them the large pelagic fish, tuna, sashimi, mahi-mahi, kingfish. They're delicious. We can't get enough. The intensity, the demand is so high, and the fishing pressure so great. We think we could never run out. We just don't bring ourselves to believe that we could go down to the local fish and chip shop and not be able to get some fish and chips or swordfish steak for dinner or go to the local Japanese restaurant and not order a tuna sashimi. So I developed an interest in marine science. When I was in my 20s, thereabouts, my girlfriend dropped me. My dad said, don't worry, son. Plenty of fish in the sea. <laughs> but studying marine science, I already knew that, actually, all the fish in the sea are spoken for. They have been since the late 1980s. Despite increasing fishing effort, more and more better technology, bigger and bigger nets, we simply can't take any more. The catch has been stable. So in my research, this led me to think about a big problem. If the population is increasing, but the fish catch is stable, how are we all going to keep eating fish? This problem has been swept under the rug in a way, because up until now, aquaculture's been making up the difference. We still eat more or less the same amount of fish per capita as we did back then. But most large pelagic fish can't currently be aquaculture. There's a few exceptions. Tuna can't be aquaculture, but they are ranched, which means that they're caught out at sea, gathered up, towed all the way back to the coast in big pens like this, where they're fattened up by feeding them. So we've been fishing down the food chain, sweeping the oceans for small pelagic fish, because tuna in those cages take 15 kilos of small pelagic fish, like anchovies, sardines, pilchards, to bring you one kilogram of tuna. We're also fishing up the food chain to gather up all of that biomass, grind it down into pellets, feed other aquaculture, salmon and the like. So around this time, I uh, got invited to go over to the US 
the University of Southern California as a visiting scholar, work with these amazing scientists. We're funded by NASA to look at uh, how NASA products remote sensing by satellite of the ocean, temperatures and currents, chlorophyll and productivity, and uh, ocean circulation models, computer models of the ocean that, that simulate the entire world's oceans, and where the convergence zones are, where the best feeding grounds for fish are, how we can take this data and apply it to better fisheries management. But what we quickly discovered was that, in fact, the fishing industry was miles ahead of us. They were already using these products. Absolute latest in technology, satellite imagery, companies that gather up the satellite data and analyze it and then send it out to the fishing boats. Some countries even have government-funded science teams onshore looking at the data, looking at the meteorology, running models, identifying the best places for the fish to aggregate and sending the fishing fleets there. Now, all that's standing between these large pelagic fish and almost certain annihilation is the fisheries managers that manage the fisheries. And this is done generally by international convention between countries. But we don't fish at the maximum economic yield. That is where you get the most fish per dollar spent fishing. We don't even aim for it. We aim to fish at the maximum sustainable yield. That is the absolute estimate, the maximum amount we can take out each year and not push the stock towards collapse. Now, fishery scientists are not using this latest technology of the satellites and the ocean circulation models in their day-to-day -day stock assessments. They still use pretty much technology that they have since the 1950s. The processing power's increased a little bit, the uh, computers are better, the models are a little more sophisticated. But they're fundamentally retrospective. They take all the data that the fish that we caught this year, the fish that we caught last year, the fish that we caught the year before, and they try and estimate how many fish there are still out there. A couple of problems with this approach. One, there's a big uncertainty. So when there's uncertainty, the fishing industry can take advantage of this, and, and negotiations between countries as well. We're not sure exactly how many fish there are out there. There might be more, so we should set the quotas higher. Another problem is that this retrospective approach doesn't allow any intrinsic ability to account for environmental variability. Not year to year, La Nina, El Nino cycles greatly affect the fishery, nor looking out into the future with changing ocean conditions, climate change. None of this is accounted for in the current models. They're retrospective. One of the few ways, though, that fisheries managers are able to incorporate the environmental data is through tagging studies like this one. So we go out and we capture the fish, we put a tag in them. Sometimes it's, it's just a return tag, so it gives a reward for the fishermen to return it and say where they caught the fish, how far did it move. Other times there's sophisticated electronic tags that report back the fish's position, the temperature, and the environment that it's experiencing. This magnificent creature is a thresher shark. It's quite unique in that um, it gathers its prey by swimming up to it and then whacking it with its long whip-like tail. And then while well, the fish is there stunned, it gobbles it down. This was heavily fished, thresher sharks, in the late 1980s for fish and chips. They make great fish and chips. And um, they became so scarce that the fishing boats wasn't economically viable any longer, so they moved on to more valuable species. Since then, the, the stock appears to be recovering. But Management for this fish is only just starting now. We don't, we're only doing the first stock assessments. We don't really know how many are out there or how well the population is doing. We know that they migrate and what environmental drivers are causing them to migrate up and down the California coast, for example. Also, we know that at certain time of years, pregnant females are encountered and caught in a Californian bite. It's now a big recreational fishery because they make a good sport fish. What environmental conditions are causing the females to be there and to pup at that time? What if we could have fisheries management that took that into account? Well, so that group of scientists I showed you earlier, busy working away with NASA's money, trying to take some tools and, and give them to fisheries managers for free to use to work on these problems. So what we do is we, we allow the fisheries managers to take all the data they have, tagging data, catch and effort data, 
where was the fish, when, and how many were caught there, and match that up with satellite remote sensing, in this case, sea surface temperature. So we start to be able to relate with the fish in its own environment. What is it experiencing? What temperatures does it like? Where does it like to be at certain times of the year? And try and work out for what reasons. Already we're having some success. A big problem for fisheries managers, these large pelagic fish, is that the maximum sustainable yield, the maximum amount of fish that you can take out each year has got a fairly good relationship with how many new fish come in each year. It's known as recruitment. It simply means the number of fish that survive from being spawned all the way up to when they're big enough to start getting caught by the fishery. Now, recruitment is highly variable. It's very difficult to account for in fisheries models. In fact, they can't get a reliable of how many new fish there are now until in about three years' time when they've caught the fish at several different ages. So, fisheries manager today he has to tell the fishermen what quota they're allowed to go out and catch next year. Or well, you won't know for three years how many more fish there are. But we found out that there's quite a close correlation between slight changes in the timing and intensity of, of the ocean warming and cooling each year, which have a very good correlation to the tuna, the, the recruitment of the tuna. So imagine fisheries management, where instead of in three years' time knowing how many new fish there are each year, long after the quotas have been set, the fish caught. Imagine fisheries management where we could know now. The thresher shark. In that survey with the tagging, the other most commonly encountered shark is the mako shark. We're able to analyze with these two species, where do they overlap? You can see in, in some environmental parameters, there's ocean conditions in which both species co-occur. But there's other conditions in which you're much more likely to find either the thresher shark or much more likely to find the mako shark. Now imagine that one of these fish was your target species, say a swordfish. The other fish, bycatch that you didn't want to catch, say a turtle. Imagine fisheries management where you could look dynamically at the ocean and see the conditions under which turtles and uh, swordfish are going to be in the same place at the same time or places where you're much more likely to find the swordfish without running into the turtles. This is the kind of environmental data that we need to bring into fisheries management. The world's moving towards ecosystem-based fisheries management, which is where you take into account the entire ecosystem, not just the target species of the fishery, but its predators and its prey, and also the environment in which they exist. But this isn't really possible with today's technology for large pelagic fish. Areas like the entire Pacific Ocean are simply too vast and there's too many interactions. But we do have the same data that the fishing fleet does. And that's what we can put to use in these models. So here's the predicted habitat of the thresher shark in red. The actual locations where they're caught in pink. Imagine fisheries management where you could define closure areas that moved with the seasons or moved with the actual ocean conditions instead of just being static in time and place. I want to finish with a warning. This is what can happen when a fishery is fished above its maximum sustainable yield. The southern, the southern bluefin tuna, which we catch here in Australia, is only at about 5% of its unfished biomass. That is 5% of how many there would be out there if we weren't fishing them at all. But we're still fishing. And in fact, 96% of Australia's catch quota is caught young at about two years when they don't reach sexual maturity until about 12 years old and towed back to those grow up pens that I showed you earlier. The reason for that is at that age, they put on fat the most quickly for the least amount of food, thereby making the most profit for the fishing companies. So what can we, the public, do about it? The fishing industry puts enormous pressure on fisheries regulators to set high quotas and to make use of that uncertainty in the models. Hopefully, by reducing the uncertainty, we take away some of that leverage. But what can we, the public, do about it? Well, if you love fish, if you love to eat fish, I say to you, go out and learn about that fish. Knowledge is power. And power, the people can get turned into political power. And then, power can lead to change. 
Finally, I did eventually get some sashimi grade fish. And I hope that one day my grandchildren will also be able to do the same. <laughs>